So this question asks for a reaction to be spontaneous only at high temperatures, which of the following conditions must be met? So remember that free energy is the product of enthalpy minus temperature times the entropy change. So if we have a negative delta G, that means we have a spontaneous reaction. If we have a positive delta G, that means a non-spontaneous reaction. So how can we get it so that delta G is, um, that the reaction is spontaneous only at high temperatures? Well, that's going to be if we have a positive enthalpy, so an endothermic reaction, and a positive entropy. So let's see why this works. Let's consider two extremes. Extreme one. At point zero 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 d, uh, that's supposed to be a zero, just a very bad looking one. Zero four k. So basically, at a really low temperature. So at really low temperatures, if we consider that free energy is equal to delta H minus T delta S, if this T is practically zero, we're not doing it at absolute zero because no reaction could take place where there's no kinetic energy in the molecules. But if this is essentially zero, then Basically, this whole T delta S term would be about equal to zero. So what does that mean? Well, it means at low temperatures, this reaction is driven solely by the enthalpy, which is endothermic. So at low temperatures, delta G would just be equal to, well, about equal to delta H, which is positive which would mean non-spontaneous, okay? So I'm just going to plug in the plus zero. It's practically zero because T delta S, if T is such an infinitesimally small number, then T delta S is also going to be very small. But then consider scenario two. At one billion Kelvin, well, at a high temperature, what's going to happen to this T delta S term? Well, if this is, on the contrary, really ridiculously large, well, if the temperature is ridiculously large, that means that our T delta S term is also going to be ridiculously large, right? So if we consider what our free energy equation would look like, we would have delta G equals a positive number. So that's our, uh, I'm just going to annotate this down here, that's our delta H minus A positive number, a ridiculously large positive number. And this is, just as a reminder, T delta S. Since delta S is positive, if the temperature is a massive temperature, we're going to have a massive positive number to subtract. And whenever you have a positive number, like delta H, minus a much more positive number, you're going to get a negative. So at really high temperatures, delta G would be negative, which would be spontaneous. Now, what's the cutoff between a high temperature and a low temperature? That varies for any given reaction. In order to answer that, we would need more quantitative data. But a reaction that is spontaneous only at high temperatures and not at low temperatures has a positive entropy and a positive enthalpy. So it's going to be choice E. In this problem, we want to calculate the free energy change at 1,000 degrees Celsius. So note that 1,000 degrees Celsius is in bold. So why is that important? Well, remember, delta G standard only applies at 298K, okay? Um, it turns out that um, enthalpy and entropy do not change appreciably with temperature, but free energy changes wildly. So this whole column here is not going to be used to us. This would only be useful at 298K. So I'm just going to scratch that out. What we can do, however, is we can find the free, or we can find the enthalpy change of the reaction, the entropy change of the reaction, and then we can plug it into this equation up here that relates free energy with enthalpy and entropy and temperature. So that's going to be our problem solving strategy. First, let's solve for the enthalpy change using the Products minus reactants rule. So, first let's do the enthalpy. The delta H standard of the reaction is going to be equal to the enthalpy change of the products, which is two moles of iron, which has a standard enthalpy of formation of zero kilojoules per mole, plus three times 
the enthalpy of formation of carbon dioxide gas, which is negative 393.5 kilojoules per mole. So there we have our products, and then we'll do minus reactants. So first let's look at the iron oxide. So we have negative 822.2 plus three times the enthalpy of formation of carbon monoxide, which is negative 110.5 kilojoules per mole. So then when we compute this all together, we're going to get that the enthalpy change is... So we'll get that the enthalpy change is negative 26.8 kilojoules per mole. So that's exothermic. Now we're going to do the same exact thing, only for the entropy of the reaction. So our entropy change is going to be equal to the entropy of the products. So there we have the total entropy of our products. And we're going to do minus reactants. So there we have our fully written out expression. And let's see what we get for our delta S and we get 11.5 joules per mole Kelvin. So just remember that when we use an equation that relates enthalpy and entropy together, they need to be in the same terms. Okay, so I'm just going to divide this by 1,000 to put it into kilojoules per mole. There we go, and now we can use our free energy equation and find out what the free energy change is at 1,000 degrees Celsius. So delta G equals delta H, that's our enthalpy minus T. Now remember, T has to be in Kelvin, so we're going to add 273, 1,273 Kelvin times delta S. And we will get that the delta G at 1,273 Kelvin is negative 41.4 kilojoules per mole as our answer. So as a heads up, as of fall 2018, um, a question like this will not be on the second exam. However, it will make an appearance on the third exam so we can talk about how to do this one. Um, what we're going to need to know here is that EDTA and ethylene diamine are called ligands. And when they bind, EDTA binds at not one not two, not three, not four, not five, but six sites when it acts as a Lewis base. So EDTA, six binding sites as a Lewis base. Whereas ethylene diamine, this molecule over here, takes up one, two binding sites. So this qu question just wants to know in which case does the metal complex ion not have a coordination number of six. Um, the coordination just means how many um, lone pairs of electrons are being donated to the central metal. So we're going to go through each of these answers. Um, this first one, the EDTA, remember, takes up six, so that has a coordination number of six. This next one, nickel ethylene diamine three. Well, each one takes up two, and there's three of them. So this also equals six. And it should be noted that when we're looking for coordination number, we're just concerned with the non-metal stuff inside the brackets, okay? So the brackets are the coordination sphere, and then everything inside of it, we have a central metal, and then we have ligands in there. We just want to know how many lone pairs of electrons are being donated from the ligands. So this next one, we have H2O, there's four of them, and we have ethylene diamine. So water... Unless we're told otherwise, we can assume that they have a coordination number of 1. So 4 times 1, or sorry, identity of 1, um, plus ethylene diamine, which is 2. This gives us another 6. Okay. Up next, we have 2 waters and an ethylene diamine. That's 2 times 1 plus 2, which equals 4. So this one here has a coordination number of 4. Again, we're going to worry about that more for exam 3 in fall 2018, but couldn't hurt to answer the question, so it is choice D. In this problem, we're given a graph that involves some thermodynamic entities. So the most important thing for looking at graphs is to find out, pull out as much information as you can from the graph. So we can see here that for our delta H, so delta H, just by looking at the graph, we can see that delta H is negative, right? Um, and again, uh, delta H does not really change that appreciably with temperature, 
So the first thing I want to write down here is that the delta H is negative. This is an exothermic process. Okay? So next, let's look down here at our T delta S term. So down here we can see T delta S. What's happening with T delta S? As temperature increases, T delta S gets more and more negative. So what can we infer then about delta S? Delta S must be negative 2, okay? Not negative 2 the number, but negative comma T-O-O, -O, negative as well. And I'm just going to actually rewrite this because the uh, doceri watermark is kind of getting in the way here. So delta S must be a negative value, okay? So, why is that significant? Well, now we know that we have an exothermic reaction that leads to a decrease in entropy. And now we can answer all the prompts that were given. So, the first question says delta, or the first statement says delta S for the reaction is positive. Lol, I should think not. That's not true at all. We just showed that it was negative. The next one says the reaction is exothermic. I like that one. It is indeed. And the last one says that the reaction is spontaneous at temperatures above 40 K. So let's consider 40 Kelvin. 40 Kelvin is right here. Wha pow! So we see that something kind of interesting happens at 40 Kelvin. Uh, what is that? Well, we can see that our delta H line and our T delta S line cross. Well, what does that mean? To answer that, look no further than this classic equation right here. So before you get to this point, how do delta H and T delta S compare? We can see that this is more negative than our T delta S is, right? So considering this reaction, or this equation up here, before 40 Kelvin, and sorry I've been saying degrees, Kelvin don't get degrees, um, before 40 Kelvin, we have the enthalpy, which is more negative, minus a less negative number. So before 40 Kelvin, that's going to give us a negative value for delta G. And what does that mean? It means that the reaction would be spontaneous there. But what happens after 40 Kelvin? Well, after 40 Kelvin, our enthalpy remains constant, but our T delta S term is getting increasingly more negative. So we'd have a negative minus an even more negative number, which would afford us a positive delta G. So after 40 Kelvin, the delta G would be positive, which means non-spawn. Okay? So before 40 Kelvin, spontaneous. After 40 Kelvin, non-spawn. This says spontaneous at temperatures above 40 Kelvin. That's not true. That's the opposite of what's happening here. So the only one that is right is 2. In this next one, we're plotting entropy change with temp against temperature changes. Um, a few things to point out here. Um, first, at really low temperatures. So over here, we have our absolute 0. This is 0 K. Um, or okay, if you will. Um, so we have our solid phase here. Eventually we get to a point where shoop, the entropy increases, but the temperature doesn't change. What's going on here? Well, this is the process known as melting. Eventually, once our solid is completely melted, we'll end up with what phase? We'll end up with our liquid phase, and as we heat it, the entropy will increase and increase and increase until we get to a point where, once again, the temperature remains consistent, but the entropy goes up. What is this? Well, it's another phase change. It is evaporation. Okay. Then, after our molecule of interest has evaporated, we are left with just a gas. And then as you increase the temperature, once again, the entropy is going to keep on increasing. Okay, so let's see which of these statements are true. The first one says, the substance boils at temperature B. Okay, so this is temperature B. 
This is where evaporation takes place, right? Um, evaporation, also known as boiling. So this one is true. The question is asking for which one is not true, so we can eliminate this choice. This one says the delta S of fusion, the entropy change of the solid to liquid, is greater than the entropy change of vaporization liquid to gas. Well, if we consider the entropy change of fusion right there, and we compare it against the entropy change as it's being evaporated, we can see that this is much greater for the evaporation. So that means that this one actually is false, which means this is our answer. Let's just go through the other three choices, though. This substance is a liquid between temperatures A and B. So between here and here, is it a liquid? That it is. So I like that in terms of being true. I don't like it in terms of being the answer because we're looking for what's false. D, increasing the temperature of the gas by one Kelvin produces a larger value of delta S than the temperature um, of the solid. Well, just look at this slope versus this slope here. We can see that temperature has a much more dramatic impact once it's in a gaseous phase. Um, because that's after we've overcome all the intramolecular forces. So this one is indeed true, meaning it's not our answer. And then finally, E, the substance melts at temperature A. Hey, look, it's melting at temperature A. So choice B is the false one.